Okay, so this will be the seventh lecture over NMR spectroscopy. And so I just wanted to go back in and talk about a few things in a little bit more detail here. So first of all, if we look at the NMR of alcohols, amines and amides and carboxylic acids we could throw in here. Where they all have an acidic, or let's just say partial positive hydrogen. Um, so hydrogen with significant positive charge density and how that affects the NMR. Um, so we've talked about alcohols before. So if you have an alcohol, so question is, does the hydrogen and oxygen split with the hydrogens on carbon or not? So sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So this first spectra that I have drawn is in the situation where the hydrogen on oxygen does split with the hydrogen on carbon. So in this case, the OH would see two neighbors, so it would be a triplet. Right, so that would be the OH. And then the CH2 has three neighbors there and one neighbor there. So four plus one would be a pentet, so CH2. And the CH3 is not affected because it's too far away from the OH. It's not, the OH is not a neighbor to the CH3, so it just sees two hydrogens there, so it's a triplet. And so the CH3 is gonna be the same no matter what. But usually that's not what you see for alcohols. Usually the OH does not split with the hydrogens on carbon. So in this case, the OH would just be typically a broad singlet. And then if the CH2 doesn't see the OH, if it only sees the CH3, then it's only got three neighbors, so that would be a quartet. And then again, the CH3 is not affected because it's too far away. Or what you may see is if you took this, so you typically take this NMR, for example, and then add a drop of D2O, and then you see the OH signal goes away. And, <clears throat> and we've talked about why it does that, right? Because the deuterium exchanges with the OH. Okay, so, so under what circumstances will you see this spectra, and under what circumstances will you see this type of spectra? <clears throat> So for alcohols, so the OH will typically split with the CH if it's at high, high temperature. So if you increase the temperature, you're more likely to see the splitting. Or if you go to really low concentrations, you're more likely to see the OH split with the CH. Conversely, the OH does not split with CH if you go to lower temperatures or higher concentrations. You know, so why does temperature and concentration affect things? Well, as you know from alcohols, they are typically hydrogen bonded to each other. So hot partial positive hydrogen can hydrogen bond to partial positive negative, partial negative oxygen. And then you can have rapid hydrogen exchange between the oxygens. Right, so the oxygen on one alcohol can move to the oxygen to the other alcohol. And you end up with this. So if the hydrogen is rapidly moving between the two oxygens, then the carbon doesn't see it and it doesn't split with it. And so that's usually what your alcohol NMRs look like. Uh, so how does concentration affect this? Well, if you go to really low concentration, then two alcohols can't find each other. If they can't find each other, they can't hydrogen bond. And so in that case, the hydrogen is setting on the oxygen, and now the hydrogens on carbon is gonna, are going to see it, and they're going to split with each other. Or if you go to high temperature, then high temperature is going to break the hydrogen bonds. And so then if you have... Um, alcohol that's not hydrogen bonded to something else again the hydrogen can exchange and if it can't exchange then the, it's going to split with the hydrogens on carbon so it's also affected by a stir there's also a steric effect to it so if we took these two alcohols uh, well the two methyl groups will create a, a sterically congested environment around the OH which means it's not going to be able to hydrogen bond as well so what you would typically see for an alcohol like this then, you would typically see a broad signal. Um, if you have a lot of sterics and it can't hydrogen bond, then that signal is gonna be sharper. You could also make it sharper if you have an alcohol. If you dilute the sample, the OH signal should sharpen up because you're gonna disrupt hydrogen bonding. Or if you raise the temperature, you're gonna disrupt hydrogen bonding and that would sharpen the signal. Okay, so you also see the same thing in carboxylic acids, right? That's a partial positive hydrogen. Um, of course, carboxylic acids, it's easy to identify because it's down in 10 to 12 ppm and there's typically nothing else in that region. Whereas for alcohols, 
right? They're typically between um, zero to four ppm, and there's lots of other signals in that region. So, you know, identifying an alcohol, sometimes it's easy because it's a broad signal, but sometimes it's, particularly if it's splitting with the CHs and you have doublets and triplets, then it can be more difficult to identify which would be where you'd want to add a drop of D2O and see if that hot signal would go away. Um, but for carboxylic acids, signals are between 10 and 12, but it can be difficult to see because sometimes it's really, really broad and it may be so broad that you can't even hardly see a signal there. And of course, it would exchange with D2O as well um, by the same process. It can hydrogen bond to D2O and then hydrogen go on to to D2O and deuterium can go on to the carboxylic acid and now you don't have a signal for the carboxylic acid anymore. You would now see a signal for the HOD somewhere upfield um, between 1 and 3 ppm typically. So amines do the same thing. Um, so NHs, hydrogens on nitrogens of amines usually do not split with hydrogens on carbon for the same reason as alcohols. So if you took the NMR of this amine, uh, that NH2, would typically just show up as a broad singlet that would integrate to two hydrogens. But they could be difficult to integrate again if you have a broad signal, right? They can be difficult to integrate accurately. And so then the CH2, of course, would be, if, if, if the NH2 is not splitting with the CH2, then the CH2 is not splitting with the NH2. So in this case, the CH2 would just see that one neighbor and it would be split into a doublet rather than a quartet if it's split with the NH2 as well. So same process, right? Amines can undergo hydrogen exchange because they're polar, polar NH bonds, and they can hydrogen bond to each other. So then they would also be, amines would also be concentration temp and temperature dependent, and however crowded the nitrogen is would affect its ability to hydrogen bond, so there would be a steric effect as well. <clears throat> Okay, so NHs on amides, however, NHs on amides typically do split with hydrogens on carbon. So even though the NH can form very strong hydrogen bonds, it generally does not undergo exchange. So if we took this molecule, so that hydrogen has two neighbors there, so this NH would be split into a triplet. And similarly for the CH2, it's got one neighbor there and it's got three neighbors there, so four plus one, the CH2 would be a, a pentet and not a quartet because it would split with the NH, typically in amides that happens. <clears throat> okay, so we don't want to forget the resonance effect, so if we're dealing with alcohols which have lone pairs, amines which have lone pairs, uh, they're very good resonance donors, so if we took a lone pair on nitrogen, right, we can move those there to make a double bond and move these onto those electrons on the carbon as a lone pair. So that means the hydrogen here is going to be shielded and the carbon there is going to be shielded as well if you're doing carbon-13 anymore. And then we can move those down there and move these up here. And if we move these here and move those up here, then the two ortho carbons to the nitrogen can bear that negative charge. <clears throat> so the two ortho carbons are going to be shielded in carbon-13 anymore. And then the hydrogens attached to those carbons would also be shielded, so they would be upfilled. So if you took the NMR of this molecule, so this hydrogen here on this position labeled one, right, they're going to be more upfilled than the hydrogens on position labeled two because of this resonance effect. <clears throat> so you'd see something similar in this molecule when you have conjugated double bonds, right? We can take this pi electrons, move them there and move those electrons on the oxygen to make a lone pair. So the point is this carbon has some positive charge density to it. So what is that gonna to do to chemical shift? That's gonna deshield the proton and it's gonna send it to a higher chemical shift. So the hydrogen on carbon A would be further downfield than the hydrogen on carbon B because carbon B does not bear any of that positive charge. <clears throat> so you would observe something similar in carbon 13, the carbon with hydrogen A is going to be further downfield than the carbon with hydrogen B on it. Even though they're both alkenes, one will be significantly further downfield than the other one will be. Okay, so just briefly, just a few words about 
NMR of nuclei other than proton and carbon. So very common to do fluorine NMR uh, because it has an I equals one half value, just like hydrogen. Uh, so fluorine NMR basically can be interpreted very similar to how proton NMR can be interpreted. And the same is true for phosphorus 31. It has an I of one half value and it behaves similar to proton as proton NMR would. <coughs> So if we took the NMR of this molecule, so if we did the 1H NMR, so HA and HB are equivalent to each other, so they would not split each other, but they would be split by the fluorines. So two fluorines, so two plus one would be triplet. So the CH2 would be a triplet in proton NMR. And of course the same applies to fluorine 19 NMR. If you did fluorine 19 NMR, the two fluorines are equivalent, so they would not split each other. But they do have two neighbors, HA and HB are neighbors to fluorine. So HA and HB would split fluorine. So two H neighbors. So two plus one. And the fluorine signals would be triplets. <clears throat> Although commonly what's done in fluorine NMR is you typically would do decoupled spectra. So the, pro, so the fluorines would not see the hydrogens if you do a decoupled spectra, so all the fluorines would, be, would show up as singlets. So every different fluorine would have its own signal that would be a singlet. <clears throat> so why, why is it typically done in a decoupling mode? And that's because coupling constants are absolutely huge with fluorine. <clears throat> so hydrogen and fluorine, so if they're on this, so the, that means they're on the same carbon, right? So they're... <clears throat> two bonds away from each other, so that means they're on the same carbon. <coughs> so in that case, the coupling constants are about 44 to 81 hertz. <coughs> if the fluorine's on an adjacent carbon, so J3 coupling, right, we have one, two, and three. So that means the fluorine's on an adjacent carbon, so those coupling constants are about three to 25 hertz. And if it's uh, two carbons away, so one, two, three, four bond coupling, uh, then that's about zero to four hertz. <clears throat> okay, so again, typically to simplify fluorine NMR, you would do a decoupled, you would decouple it from carbon and proton so that all of the fluorines appear as singlets. So for fluorine NMR, it has a large chemical shift range from zero to 800 ppm, uh, but if it's only organics involved, so no metals that the fluorines are attached to, uh, then the range is about 50, negative 50 to negative 250 ppm where you see the fluorine signals at. <clears throat> okay, so uh, if it's you're doing carbon-13 NMR, the fluorines will split carbons as well. Uh, so if it's, if the fluorines directly attached to carbon, so that would be one bond coupling. So those coupling constants are huge, about 200 to 400 hertz. <clears throat> right, if the fluorines um, a carbon away. So if we're talking about that carbon, so one, two. So that carbon can be split by fluorine as well. So those coupling constants are uh, 20 to 40 hertz. And if the fluorine's three carbons away, right, that carbon can be split by the fluorine as well. And again, the further away you are, the smaller the coupling constant is. So those are about 10 to 30, 30 hertz. <clears throat> so just as an example, um, so this is a molecule that we've made in the main research lab. <clears throat> so if we did the proton NMR, or car this is carbon-13 NMR on this molecule. Uh, so we see this is carbon at 21 ppm, that at 46 ppm. C double bond O, of course, is way down filled, so that's about 154 ppm. So nothing interesting there. That's at 121 ppm. This is with a nitrogen attached, that's electronegative, so that's about 135 ppm. Uh, but the two that are interesting is this carbon and this carbon. And of course, this is equivalent to that. <clears throat> um, so those carbons sh uh, showed up as doublets in the carbon-13 NMR. Right, and so for this one, with the fluorine directly attached, so that's one bond coupling, so those are huge coupling constants. So its signal looked like this. There was a peak at 159 and a peak at 156.5 ppm. So normally in carbon-13, you may just count the signals and say, okay, that's how many carbons I have. But when you have a fluorine presence, you have to be aware of that because this does not mean 
this does not mean there's two carbons, right? That's, that's not two different carbons. That is one carbon that has been split into a doublet. Um, even though they're 2.5 ppm apart, uh, it's just because the fluorine has a huge coupling constant with carbon. So 2.5 ppm, so we have a 400 megahertz NMR, but that's proton NMR. If you do carbon 13 NMR, then if you remember from a previous lecture, it's a quarter of the energy required to cause the carbon to do a nuclear spin flip. So you're only actually using 100, around 100 megahertz radio frequency radiation. So 100 megahertz times 2.5, so that would be a 250 hertz coupling constant. So even though it looks like two separate signals, it's really just a doublet. And you have to be aware of that when you're counting signals in carbon-13 if you have a fluorine present. And this was observed for this carbon as well. Uh, that's only one, one carbon away, so two bonds away. So those are pretty large coupling constants. So that appeared as a doublet as well with a coupling constant of about 12 to 20 to 40 hertz. <clears throat> and then and the fluorines can have a huge impact on uh, chemical shifts as well. So for this molecule, this is what its proton NMR looked like. All right, so this CH2 was a triplet um, because it doesn't split with equivalent hydrogens, right? So it only splits with that CH2. And then this is further downfield because it's next to nitrogen. That was a triplet of about 3.4. Uh, this NH, since it's an amid, um, its amids NHs are further downfield than amine NHs. So that's about 6.3 ppm. Uh, but what was interesting is these two hydrogens are way upfield. Those are at 6.8 ppm compared to this one. This one's all the way down at 8 ppm. So why such a big difference in chemical shift? All of those hydrogens are just on aromatic rings. Well, you can understand it if you look at the resonance structures. So with the fluorine, you can take these electrons, move them down here, and move those onto that carbon to make a lone pair. So if that carbon bears a lone pair, has increased electron density, that's gonna shield the hydrogen and it's gonna make it move upfield in its chemical shift. Okay, so let's take this then and move it here to make a double bond and those electrons can go there. And then if we move these here, then those can go there. So again, this ortho to the fluorine has a high electron density as well. So those two ortho hydrogens are gonna be upfield compared to this hydrogen. So if you notice the resonant structures, right, the negative charge is never on that carbon. So that hydrogen and that carbon is not gonna be shielded. They're actually gonna be deshielded from the, by the fluorine because the fluorine is also very electronegative. So by induction through the sigma bonds, it pulls electron density out of the ring. Um, only by resonance does it push electron density into the ring. So the ortho and para hydrogens would be shielded compared to the meta hydrogen, and so you see a big difference in chemical shift. Okay, and then finally, uh, one minor point to make here. Um, so, can the uh, carbon-13 be split by hydrogen? Well, yes, it can. So if you're doing carbon-13, they're, they're split by hydrogen, so you typically do, do do decoupled carbon 13s because the coupling constants between carbon and hydrogen is, are large. And if you remember, that makes the spectrum more complex. Uh, can carbon 13 be split by another th carbon 13? And the answer is yes. Um, but what are the odds that there be two, two carbons side by side in a molecule, considering that the natural abundance of carbon 13 is only 1.1%. So the chances of two carbon 13s being next to each other is minimal. So you don't have to worry about carbon-13 splitting carbon-13 and carbon-13 NMR. So if you're doing proton NMR, uh, well, yeah, so we made this point, what's the chance of a carbon-13 being next to a proton? Extremely high, right? Because proton H1 has a 99.9% .9 abundance. So yeah, carbon-13 is gonna be split by hydrogen and it would be split by fluorine because fluorine's NMR active and fluorine-19 is it. NMR active isotope and fluorine 19 is about 100% of nature isotope uh, abundance. So carbon 13s will be split by protons and fluorines. <clears throat> so how about in proton NMR, will, will hydrogen be split by carbon? Uh, well, most of the carbon in nature is carbon 12 and carbon 12 is not NMR active. Um, so carbon 12 is not gonna split hydrogen, but carbon 13 would. 
So yes, if a hydrogen is on a carbon that is a carbon-13, then that carbon-13 will be a neighbor to it and it can split it. But since there's only 1.1% natural abundance of carbon-13, the chances of any hydrogen being attached to a carbon-13 is minimal, right? Uh, but you can observe hydrogen being split by carbon-13. Um, you, you see that in what are called satellite signals. So if this is the parent signal, so this is the main signal from the hydrogens being split by other hydrogens. Uh, if you zoomed in a lot, uh, then symmetrically disposed about that main signal, you would have the satellite signals, which is arising from the carbon-13 splitting the hydrogen. Uh, so, but those satellite signals are only 0.54% of the intensity of the main peak, right? So they're basically, low, they're down in the noise of the spectrum, but if you zoomed in enough, you could see, typically see those satellite signals from the carbon-13 splitting uh, the hydrogens in the molecule. <clears throat> and again, whether you see those signals or not is going to depend on how well you have your instrument shimmed and and the resolution of your instrument, right? the more powerful the magnet, the better resolution that you get. Okay, that's it.